One year ago, I got to interview one of my favorite authors, Denise Duffield Thomas. She's a money mindset mentor, and at the time of this recording, she's the author of four wonderful entrepreneurial books. And to commemorate the one year anniversary, I decided to wear this same outfit. I'm weird, I know, but just go with it. What's up, this is Melissa, and welcome back to the channel. I'm here with the info you need to get the results you want, because today I wanna to review the conversation I had with Denise Duffield Thomas so that we can get some actionable steps together and understand how your money mindset plays a huge role in your ability to sign and keep clients. My whole channel is about marketing, online business, mindset, and manifestation. Hit that subscribe button and join the family so you can grow a profitable online business. Now, let's get into it. Okay, I'm about to hop into an interview that I did exactly one year ago with my favorite author, Denise Duffield Thomas, and I'm so excited to watch it back because I haven't watched it since. So, here we go. Hello, hello, everybody. I am so excited for our special guest. I know you've heard me talking about this moment right now for so long. I'm so excited. What an honor to have with me here today author Denise Duffield Thomas. Thank you so much for being here today. Melissa, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it because I heard that you don't have guests a lot on your podcast. So that makes it even more special for me. It is true. My podcast rarely has guests. It's only for special occasions. And then also I will share this with my spiritual women entrepreneurs community. But having you here is truly an honor. Not only am I a huge fan, um, but I use your books as part of the marketing material, the teaching material inside of my Marketing with Intention program. All of my students have read all of your books. We have discussions on them. So it is truly, truly an honor to have you here with me today. Wow, I'm honored. Thank you. Yes, it's so exciting. That is the truth, you know? You know, we use Denise Duffield Thomas's books inside of my Marketing with Intention community because it's just such a good way to release your money blocks and really move your business forward by unleashing what's inside of your mind, those limiting beliefs that are keeping you stuck. And I truly believe that mindset is a huge pillar in the success of your business growth. Before we get started, I would like to pull a a card from my affirmation deck because I think it's a very special moment and we can like reset. Um, I know yes. you have one too, but I should I do one as well, right? Do too? Yeah, let's do it together. Yeah, I'll do it too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you if you wanted me to pull a card during this. So yes. you tell me what I do with these. So How many you cards your deck. Uh, there is one yes. card in there, which is just the instructions. So you can get rid of that. This was super exciting because Denise Duffield Thomas, one of my favorite authors, has my spiritual affirmation deck in her hands she's pulling a card and it's just a beautiful thing to see how i've created has gone to the the planet into the hands of my favorite author for now and yeah, then because these are brand new i just got them from yay. the post office from you so then we're going to shuffle which might be a little loud but that's totally fine <laughs> okay they're so pretty too shuffle your cards yes my the, the perfect size I um I really struggle with affirmation cards when they're too big to hand handle, and I don't have like massive or small hands, but they're a perfect size. Thank you. I picked this size specifically because when they're too small, they're just not as special in my mind, and when they're too big, you can't yeah. shuffle, you can't hold them. So what I like to do is close my eyes and just take a deep breath and kind of set an intention or what it is I might be struggling with that I want to overcome, and I just take a deep breath. We're going to go into this little ritual that I do with my affirmation deck. And if you have an affirmation deck at home, please join in with us. I kind of set an intention or what it is I might be struggling with that I want to overcome. And I just take a deep breath. And then while I'm thinking about it, I pull a card. All right. You got your card? Yes. You want to go first? Mine says, I listen to my intuition and do what feels right. Amazing. So beautiful. I love, I love the blue on it too. This one says, Gorgeous. I'm ready to keep moving forward. I have a plan of action for the year and the tools to make it happen. Yes. Yay. Beautiful. And then what I like to do is I got this, um, this picture frame from like the drugstore. And then I put my card in here and I let it sit by me all day long. That's a genius idea. Okay. That's a great idea. 
Can we just stop for a second and recognize that Denise said that I had a genius idea? <laughs> okay, let's keep going. So, yay, thanks for pulling a card with me. Oh my gosh, no, thank it's you. Like I a love dream these come so true. much. Amazing. They're so pretty. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna oh, pop enjoy. them over here. They can leave in my desk. Perfect. And they're great to pull out every day or when you're feeling stressed or when you're like, oh, I just need to come back. So great. Thanks for doing that with me. So I wanted to ask you some questions just to kind of learn who Denise is. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your childhood or your family life, you know, growing up, you had siblings or what was the, the feeling in your family? So I was born, um, my mom was 17 when she had me and she was um, very much a single parent for my whole life. So I would say my mom's kind of like a cross between Deborah Harry and Goldie Hawn. Wow. And so she's very kind of bit flighty, um, you know, doesn't like rules and we moved around a lot and she was just kind of the young fun mom in lots of ways so it was me and my brother and then later on when I was a teenager my mom had two more kids and so I'm the oldest of four and I really think that is such a huge part of my identity is I was very old for my age because I felt like I had a lot of responsibility and it's only now that I feel like I'm coming more into myself of being able to let out some more of my fun, lighthearted side because I didn't feel like I could do that as a kid. Um, and money was pretty scarce, but actually I didn't really know it was for a long time um, until my mum married um, someone who was quite wealthy when I was about 11. And that's when I really saw the power disparity come around money. And I think that's where I really made that decision of like the men have all the power and men have all the money. So I really made a decision at that young age that I would make my own money. Okay. So it's very interesting to me that it seems as though, you know, Denise's family life started kind of rocky in a way. And, you know, you could have a rocky start and then say, oh, this is how my life is. I have this hard start. So everything moving forward is like victim mode because of that difficult start that I had. In fact, Denise went the other way and said, look what I have and look what is possible. I'm going to head in this direction. And when she saw that disparity in the way she was raised before and after her mother had a second marriage, and also between the men and the women who's having the money in her life, it's amazing how she took that mess and turned it into her message or you could also say she took her adversity and turned it into her advantage and a lot of entrepreneurs share that which means that no matter where you are right now as long as you're not in victim mode and you've got your mindset on good then you're going to be able to see what is possible for you and if you have the entrepreneurial mindset and you believe in yourself and you put the actions toward it you're going to achieve it somehow. And that led me on a journey of discovery through entrepreneurship um, to coaching. And I started my business for me, really, for my own personal freedom. But now I have such a bigger purpose for my business because I see now full circle how much my work impacts women and has that ripple effect throughout the world where we have our own choices around money, whether that's from a relationship or from a boss who doesn't take care of you or an industry that doesn't appreciate you, to be able to have that freedom and power to be able to make our own decisions is something that really drives me now. Okay, so she had whatever start she had and she made those choices to take steps in a direction that would take her somewhere else. And I feel like with a lot of entrepreneurs, we go through a struggle and then when we've come out to the other side we say wow look at this journey this transformation i've been on i want to help other people do the same and so although the first why starts with oh i want to help myself or i want to overcome this thing i want to result and then we flip and we say wow 
I went through that because now I have a bigger purpose where I can now help others do the same. And so I love how Denise is talking about this ripple effect because that really is momentum. And when we build momentum, we get what we want. We start small, it grows, it grows and grows. And as long as we believe that it's possible and we're doing the work, we're going to get there. And so starting with deep down what it means to you and why you're doing it is a great first drop in the water where you put your toe in the water and get it wet and then the ripple starts to happen and now we're changing lives we're creating a whole new world our whole reality is we're surrounded by people who we've impacted we've influenced we've made a difference in other people's lives you know as an adult but for a long time it was just like how can I just have my own money how can I have my freedom how can I never have to be beholden on someone like my mom was I love that. And I'm a single mom too. So I really do get it. I wonder if that, you know, you're, you're rippling that over to all the women and all over the world. What about, uh, to your kids, you know, like breaking the, the cycle, how does that work or how does that feel? You know what being a cycle breaker is it's hard work, right? I, I see this in so many of the beautiful people in my community. It's, it's a heavy burden to, to be the first, whether it's the first person to go to university or the first person to um, have a business or the first woman in your family, which so many of us are just because of the age we live in, right? My mom didn't have choices because she was, it was the time. There was no opportunity for her. My grandmother, even fewer opportunities, right? So I, um, I know the burden of that quite well and then I'm aware of how I speak to my kids about money and but I don't try and go overboard with it I think what we can aim for with our children is neutrality around money because we were taught money is this scary taboo thing and you have to work really hard or you have to do something really hard or something you don't like for money But now we're the in-between generation. We can see that you can have leverage. You can do things that you love for money. And our kids are growing up taking that for granted, really. You know, like most kids today, they understand that kids have YouTube channels or they, you know, they, they do things and they can make money from it. But we can also try not to pass on some of those lessons that we learned around money. Because so for so many of us, our first interaction with money was a traumatic one, a little traumatic one, because most of us went to put money in our mouth at some point in our childhood. And our family members were like, don't put that in your money, like in your mouth, money's dirty. And we have this memory of just this, oh, scary thing more than pretty much anything else. And that's something we can not pass on to our kids, but also just talking about money and talking about work in a way that, that, creates a neutrality because they they live in a completely different world than we do. They'll work in a completely different way. So I'll give you an example. Instead of saying, don't put that in your mouth. I say um, to my kids, I say, hey, don't put that in your mouth. We take care of money in our family because I don't want it to be a horrible memory. And I'm not sitting down doing a lecture about money to them. I just want to be like, hey, in our family, we take care of money and making it ah, it's okay. You're allowed to touch money. You're allowed to play with money. It's totally okay. But we don't put it in our mouth. (laughs) And just neutrality, neutrality, neutrality. Good way to reframe it too. I find it very interesting how she's talking about how we are the middle generation that breaks the tradition, the bad tradition, the money habits or any habits really that are passed on. And I see it in my family as well. There's so many generations of money trauma and now it's up to us to shift that. Otherwise we're passing that along to the next generation. So it's an important indicator. If, if you aren't feeling strong with your money relationship, you are passing that on. You aren't the one that's breaking the chain. So if you want to be the chain breaker, like Denise said, it's a lot of hard work. So you have to put the work in so that it doesn't continue further on down in the generations in your family. So let me know below if you've ever read any of Denise's books and I'll link them below in the description so you can read or listen to them when it's most convenient to you. I love it. And I bet you think about that in so many different areas because that's just one example that I actually never even thought of. And I've thought of so many examples where it's like money doesn't grow on trees or all the other things, but even just 
from infancy when you're grabbing it and putting it in, don't touch it, it's dirty. So I'm sure this is coming up throughout all of our childhood and we don't even think about it till it's too late. Well, we do. And that's the thing. Kids are listening all the time. So they're listening to how we talk about money, how we talk about people with more or less money than we do. And my oldest, who's eight, I've never really sat down and like, let's have a talk about money. I just really make sure that we're saying either neutral or good things about it. But she was telling me that one of her friends was saying rich people are really bad and greedy. And, you know, I was just like, money doesn't make you good. It doesn't make you bad. You know, like, and not even to say, oh, if you work really hard, you'll have heaps of money because that's not true in our society. You know, who works harder than a nurse? Who works harder than a school teacher? Um, So I try and say things like, um, you know, if you have a dream and you're persistent, you can do anything you like rather than if you work hard. It's just those little things I think can be really subtle and and always, always just saying, you know, um, now she's get, she can see the contrast sometimes because we have a really big house. You know, we have an abundant house and they, they start to talk about things like that, you know. And so I just say, hey, we're not better than anyone else and everyone, you know, everyone lives, everyone's a nice person, everyone's a kind person, but it's tricky, right? It's tricky because we just sometimes repeat things that we've heard from our own family and we don't want our kids to be entitled. Of course we don't. We don't want them to be lazy. We want them to have a good work ethic. But our version of a work ethic comes from a completely different era and it's not necessarily useful for them. I'm having so much fun relive this moment between me and Denise Duffield Thomas. If you want to watch the full interview, I'll pop it up here so that you can watch that as well. It's a beautiful interview that we did together. And it's still one of the most amazing moments in my business where I got to interview my favorite or one of my favorite authors. So we'll just skip ahead a little bit and um, we'll see what happened later on in the interview. um, And it's not being like, I have to work in a hammock and, you know, it's not about that at all. Um, I always tell people know thyself and prosper because if you can understand what makes you tick, what your sabotages are, even what you were saying, you're not a morning person. How many articles do you see that's like five things that successful people have to do? You have to get up at 5 a.m. And we're so indoctrinated that there's one way to success and a chillpreneur is like, oh, I'll just find my way to float downstream and make things easier. So if you work best at night and you can set your business up for that, do that without apology. Okay, I love this because I am a night owl. We talked about it earlier in this interview that I skipped through, but I'm a night owl and my most productive content writing times are between 10 p.m and 2 a.m. And there are so many business books that says, wake up at 4 a.m., work out before anyone else is awake, then you journal, then you read for an hour, then you do this, then you do that, and then everyone wakes up. And there is nothing worse for my schedule and my ability to be happy and productive and awake than doing that. So I love Denise's chillpreneur philosophy where you're an entrepreneur, but you're just chilled out. And you do things in ways that fit your personality and your lifestyle and maybe your Enneagram or maybe your human design or your astrology. And you really tap into that feminine side of your business so that you're not hitting with resistance at every turn. I like people who are just like, they would be happy doing that job, you know, with a pay increase every year forever not someone who's just like, oh, I'm doing 50,000 things and I'll do this for you for now. Because that's me. And I'm, right. I always quit my jobs. You need the support <laughs> around <an> you. Employee. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the and proactive I realized, support. Yes, yes, exactly. But I realized recently um, my like assistant is really Mark's assistant. I realized that. And so I just hired someone just to help me with some of my little side projects that crop up, Um, like, you know, little books or things that I'm working on, like the retreats that I run occasionally. They were kind of outside of that. And every time I kind of approach Mark to say, 
why don't we do this? I could see and just go, no. So I went, oh, I'm going to hire my own little side assistant <laughs> and, um, and talk to her once a week. And she can, she and I can go through my, because I've just got a random task list. So I just chuck things in. One day I'll do that. But I can't be bothered asking the team because they've got their own, you know, they've got their own thing that they have to work on. And I'm just like, I just want a little side project person now. Someone to brainstorm off of and like discuss ideas. Yes, but I hire people for that actually. So even um, people who are my friends who are consultants or whatever, I'll just, sometimes I'll just hire them for a couple of sessions because I, Mark can't, um, because he's not an ideas person. If I share my ideas with him, he starts to go, but what a, and I just go, oh, no. <laughs> you know, this is very common. Denise is talking about her husband, Mark, and how they have different styles. And although Mark is extremely supportive in Denise's business and plays a part in it, she recognizes that her scatteredness of ideas may not be the best ears to fall on for Mark. And so she brings someone in to do the consulting or the brainstorming to shoot ideas off of. And I love this idea and I do it as well. If I bring up all my wonderful business ideas to my family, they're like, okay, yay, way to go, great. I don't know what else to say. And they don't really care and they don't wanna hear about it, especially when I'm so excited and I have so much to do. They support me, but if I have so much excitement and I just really wanna talk about it, the people who are gonna understand it the best are other entrepreneurs or people on the team. So if you're struggling with finding support or having support nearby, tap into other people's skill sets. If someone is great at brainstorming, hire them and let they let them be the backboard, the soundboard for you so that you're not irritating family members. <laughs> Instead, you're en energizing your business with people who are matching that energy. If you're getting value from this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can join the family and start to grow your own profitable online business. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button below. Give this video a like so that more people can see this content. And I thank you so much. Um, so I'll hire my friends who are creatives and I'll just, I'll just be like, I, I know what I want, but I need an hour of solid time. So I'm basically buying an, an accountability space for them. Um, yeah, which I, I have really someone on my team also, when I have an idea, I'm like, can we just talk about this? There's no one else in my life that will get this. You know, you like run to your, your spouse or your friends. You're like, I'm so excited about this thing. And they're not really in it. And they're like, Oh, good job, honey. You know, <laughs> you need someone who's like, let's talk about it. <laughs> Love that. Yes. And because Mark, um, doesn't have ADHD, like I do, he doesn't understand that time is just a meaningless construct to my brain so what what can you do one at a time and if you don't have a lot of money at the moment you start with um the little things that can make you feel really good that can be instead of your oh my god one day it becomes your new normal like my favorite perfume wearing nice underwear making yourself feel good using your special cup that you only use for good when you make all of that your new normal, it suddenly raises your vibration. And then, of course, you know that good things can come with that, right? When you have better standards for yourself, even it leads to better boundaries. You become more attractive to opportunities. Good things seem to be attracted to you. What Denise is talking about right now is becoming the person you want to become, stepping into that version of yourself. And it starts small with wearing pretty underwear. I love that. Or just doing something nice for yourself, taking yourself out to lunch. And now you're stepping into that level of, oh, I can take myself out to lunch like the millionaire that I want to become. So you're stepping into that version of yourself that you want to become. And when you do that, you're alerting the universe that you're ready to take that next step. So the universe matches you there and you co-create. But it starts with those little, little, little things one by one. And for some people, it means actually decluttering the stuff rather than going, oh, I'll wait for the money to come in and then I'll replace it. It's like creating a vacuum and going, I will not put up with this anymore. Um, and the cool thing is because there's so many different things in our life, you don't have to do it in, this, in the way of fake it till you make it or buying things before you're ready. You literally start with the path of least resistance or the thing that's the most obvious, the thing that's the tiniest. And I hear stories from people all the time. They go, oh, my God, I had this leaky thing and it just took like a, 
a dollar washer from Home Depot and it fixed it. And it's like, but what's that? What was the symbolism of having to put up with that forever? I love her example of needing a little washer from Home Depot to fix a leak that's been driving you crazy for years. And I have an example of this for myself. I have a recipe box with all of my family recipes that I've used to cook for my kids over the years. And it was a wooden box that I loved and I dropped it on the floor once and it broke into several pieces. And I picked it up and I tied a rubber band around it. And that was my recipe box for like five years. <laughs> and it wasn't until I said, why do I have a broken recipe box? Oh, and when the box fell on the floor, all the cards that were alphabetized became a mess. And I just picked them up and put them into that recipe box. And every time I looked for a recipe, I had to rummage through the entire thing. And it took me 10 minutes. One day I bought a new recipe box. I sat down, I alphabetized them, put them back in. And ever since it is just a joy to go into my recipe box that is not broken and alphabetized. And I waited five years to have that small solution. And from that moment forward, I said, if it's going to take me five to 10 minutes to fix it right then and there, then I'm going to deal with it right then and there. And when you live your life by that, standard of I'm going to deal with it right then and there. Your business actually grows. You actually step into that person who actually takes care of their shit. For example, if you're going to open up an email and not deal with it right then, you're going to forget to go back. People are going to slip through the cracks. Opportunities are going to miss you by. But if you say, okay, I touched the email. I deal with it right now. Now it's taken care of just like the person you want to become. So deal with your shit basically. All yeah. the small things are so symbolic. I like that. Stair-stepping, it also makes it less overwhelming. Instead of like, I have to revamp everything in my life, it's like, I'm just going to buy more chapsticks. We'll start there. We'll start there. And I noticed too a couple of years ago how much advertising talks about um, self-care, especially for women, um, as being luxurious, you know, and even looking at those things of going, wow, like, the best chocolate bar and like cheap chocolate bar, it's not like there's thousands of dollars of difference <laughs> between like the least and the most expensive. It's literally just a tiny bit. But we've kind of been taught that, um, you know, even just having washing your hair is a luxurious experience instead of just being normal self-care. So we've got to unlearn some of those things around what we're allowed to have and how much pleasure we're allowed to have. If you haven't read any of Denise's books, I highly recommend you get them. I'll drop those down in the description below. And I will also drop a link to the full interview below as well. Thank you so much for being a part of this awesome experience where I get to relive a moment in my business that was really, really meaningful for me. All right, so now that you've gotten a taste of how important your mindset is to sign clients, now I wanna share with you some practical strategies. So go ahead and click this next video about how to get clients as an online coach or healer so you can sign clients without all the stress.